Okay, we'll, uh, we'll get started. If there are any empty seats, I mean, I see a couple of empty seats. Put your hand up if you have an empty seat. So I will. So people, there'll be one here. <laughs> so two seats over here, come on in. So welcome to this special seminar. We're very lucky to have Gary Marcus visiting us today. Um, Gary's well-known scientist. He's published in nature and science and so on and so forth, psychology and neuroscience and all that. He's known also for his popular writings, he's published many books and publishes in the New York Times, New Yorker. He's a polymath and uh, he's got a lot to say and today he's going to talk about deep learning and critical appraisal. Gary, thanks for coming. Is this live? My seat is now available for a nominal price up here, front row. Um, uh, it's always a pleasure to be here in Vancouver. Um, the title is a little bit of a bait and switch, so I, I sent this title in this abstract, um, but it seems like a lot of people have already read this paper, and I don't want to entirely bore you telling you things you already know. So I'm going to um, partly talk about this paper that I published in, or published, I archived on January. Publishing is not a fair word, I suppose. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about innateness. and keynote is going to die at this moment, so I'm going to have to make up the entire talk from memory, which I don't really want to do. Why did it get a little Okay. Um, so, uh, the question for the first part of the talk is, is deep learning taking us to AGI, meaning artificial general intelligence? And my computer is so slow that I'm going to uh, wonder. Okay. Um, to, they'll get old fast if that happens. But anyway, I want to give you two world views here. One is the Forbes view of the world, um, and the other is the Smurfs view of the world. I don't think we have audio, which is unfortunate, but we'll live without it. Um, so the Forbes view of the world is that we are plotting human performance and computer performance, and we are about to be replaced by machines. And you see reflexes of this all the time, like there was a uh, um, uh, report recently when there was a small, tiny incremental advance in natural language understanding, which said humans now understand language better than people, and uh, humans will soon lose lots of jobs. And the people who wrote the report, of course, didn't know anything about computer science or benchmarks or what the test was about. The test was actually highlight the text in this passage, and the machine was able to highlight relevant text in the passage, but not answer anything that was written between the lines, which is almost all of what you do when you actually read. But anyway, there, there there is a lot of hype saying that machines are about to exceed people. And then there's this old skit I remember. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to get the sound to play, um, but from the Smurfs. And I don't know if I can camp it this way. So basically, the, the Smurfs keep saying, how far away are we? I don't know if you recognize these funny little cartoon characters from my, my childhood. Um, and Papa Smurf keeps saying, not far now. And this is how I feel about AI. How far are we from artificial general intelligence? <laughs> not far now. Um, I am you know, not alone in my view, but there's certainly a lot of people on the other side. I'm not attacking a straw man here. Um, here's Andrew Eng, for example. And he wrote something in Harvard Business Review not very long ago in which he said, Basically, that AI can do anything that you can do in a second of thought. You know, he acknowledged there was some things that might be hard. You'd have to think for weeks to be creative and write a song or whatever. I don't know which things he was thinking of. Um, but he said, if you can do it in a second, then, then a machine can. And that's a pretty optimistic view. And it's, I mean, it's no wonder that Forbes came up with that graph listening to, to people like Andrew Eng. Um, many of you, I guess, will have seen this paper because it, it Hackle, rose so many, raised so many people's hackles, I guess that's the grammatical way to say this. Um, uh, a, a couple months ago, I wrote a, people, a paper called Deep Learning, a Critical Appraisal, and I suggested uh, 10 problems for deep learning. And you can find this on archive. I'm not going to go through all 10 today. Um, if you came here wanting to pick a fight with me about one of the 10, we can get to that in the discussion period. I don't mind um, defending the claims. But they were claims like deep, deep learning so far is incredibly data hungry, which is fine in certain domains in which data are free or cheap or you can generate as much as you want, and not so good in other domains. Like if you're studying a rare disease, for example, you may not be able to obtain that much data. 
I said that deep learning was shallow. So the thing about deep learning is it's as well named as, from a certain perspective, the death tax, right? There was this thing called the estate tax and everybody thought it was kind of okay and then they renamed it the death tax and nobody wanted to pay for it anymore. So you have what's basically a uh, discriminate um, device built with a neural network and that's not very sexy and then you call it a deep learning system and it sounds like it is deep in the conceptual sense and part of what I argued in this paper is there's nothing deep in it about it in the conceptual sense and I'll give you a little bit of the, the data um, that leads to that conclusion today. So anyway, there were, there were a number of criticisms um, in this piece and I hope you will, will read it if you haven't already read it um, and I was glad to see so many people in the field uh, start to discuss it. Um, I had so much reaction that I wrote a counter reaction, if that's a word, um, called in defense of skepticism about deep learning, um, which is kind of like an FAQ. All, all the people who objected, there were many in the Twitter verse, um, uh, who objected to the piece, I tried to respond to some of the objections. Again, if you want to raise some today, that's fine. Um, for those who want to read about it offline, I, I, I had a summary at Medium. Um, one of the claims was, hey, there are lots of things that people can do in a second that are actually not very uh, easy for machines. Often they look like they're easy for machines, but only under certain circumstances. So here's one. Describe that picture. That's a task that you can all do in a second. You could look at the picture in the top left and, and say, that's a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. And um, there are machines now that can do that for that picture. There's an algorithm that was published uh, by Google in November 2014, and the New York Times wrote about it on the front page. And here's another example a per a described by the machine, captioned, as we say, um, as a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road. Well, if machines really could do this systematically and reliably, as well as human beings, that would look to me at least a little bit like artificial general intelligence. But what's really going on is that there's something called a language model here that's relatively limited, and they're trying to find the best match kind of relative to, I mean, I'm, I'm being a little bit crude, but um, relative to large sets of data. The, the critical point I want to make is that what happens with these systems is they're good in a long, if, if you look, look at a distribution with a long tail. They're, they're good at the part where you've got a lot of data and not so good at the part where you don't get much data. And not only are they not so good, but they're actually bizarre. Um, so here, here's a picture that always makes me think of Oliver Sacks' book, The Man Who mistook, mistook His Wife uh, for a Hat. Um, even if you haven't read the book, you get the idea there was a person with brain damage, critically, um, who mistook his wife for a hat. Um, well, the captioning system took this parking sign with stickers on it to be a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks. <laughs> I will tell you, and then I'll show you some data in a second, that the reaction that Jan LeCun gave me when I told him about this was he said, well, what's the big deal? People are subject to optical illusions. This is just like an optical illusion. And I said, no, Jan, this is really more like a hallucination. Um, <laughs> in a second, I will give you some relevant data. Um, since I published the, again, posted that archive paper, there have been a whole pile of papers that actually some of them came out just before I published, but there's a steady stream now of these things called adversarial examples. Um, and you get them in the real world, for example. So uh, you will see that, that to your average deep learning system, this turtle looks like a rifle. Of course, it's been fiendishly designed to look like a rifle, but one of the responses originally, um, aside from that's an optical illusion, was, well, that's just a two-dimensional world. We'll add jitter. We'll move things around. These problems will go away in the 3D world. They have not gone away in the 3D world. But you still have systems that have allegedly solved the problem of vision that really are not that robust, even in vision, which is probably the sweet spot of what they can do. Um, my favorite like this recently um, was one where you take a sticker that looks like a toaster, you put it next to a banana, and to a human it's obvious that the picture at the bottom is a banana with a weird psychedelic toaster sticker next to it. You might use a compositional representation like that. Describe it, and the deep learning system, because the toaster has like high contrast and so forth, says that's a toaster and it just completely, or almost completely forgets about the banana. Um, this is not, again, I think an optical illusion. This is, again, closer to the hallucination side of the spectrum. And there is just, there are papers like this coming out every few weeks now. It's a serious problem with deep learning. Um, on Jan LeCun's side of this argument was a paper that just came out, or so it looks like it's on LeCun, um, by Ian Goodfellow and some other people, in which they took some adversarial examples and showed that they could actually get humans to be fooled. We could argue about what fooled meant. Um, but it could actually be 
influenced, let's say, by the same things as, as the deep learning systems. And so it's looked like a rescue of the deep learning system because, hey, just like Jan said, humans are subject to the op same optical illusions. But if you look carefully um, at the structure of the experiment, humans were only given 60 milliseconds in order to make their decision. So they, you kind of cut off part of the human cognitive systems by giving them a very small amount of time. And to their credit, uh, El, El Sayed um, et al. Um, actually consider this question. And what they said basically was, if we limit the amount of time that people get, they behave like deep learning systems. If we don't, then they don't make these mistakes at all, or only on one or two of the stimuli that, um, that we have, one of which they actually put in the paper to confuse the matters. But um, in general, the errors go away if people ha have time. Well, how do they think about it and how do I think about it is a difference between bottom-up knowledge and top-down knowledge. So um, if you're working just with the pixels, that's what a psychologist would call bottom-up. And if you have knowledge about how the world works, like that there can be stickers, that um, can be toasters. A sticker near a toaster is not the same thing as a toaster. If you have that kind of prior knowledge about how the world works, um, you're not fooled by these things. So if you give, give a person half a second or a second to integrate the information, they're not actually subject to the same errors. The way I think about this as a cognitive psychologist, which is what my original training is, in, is there are lots of things that go into psychology or Another way to word for that is really intelligence. Lots of things go in, into intelligence. You have perception, you have common sense, you have planning, analogy, language, reasoning, and so forth. And the progress that's been made is almost entirely on the perception side. So deep learning, what it really is, is a way of classifying labeled things like images or sounds and so forth. It's very good. It's a very good tool for doing that classification. But Classification is not really the way that you solve these other problems, except in limited circumstances. And even in perception, it's only part of what we do in perception. It's the bottom-up part of perception, which is maybe what you know, primary visual areas in the cortex do. It's not the entire thing that I do when I look out in this scene and go from the patterns of light on my retina to understanding there's a group of people watching me and that I should you know, say intelligent things and not screw up too much and not fall asleep and so forth. So I have all this complex understanding of the scene that goes beyond the mere thing of like I could label person, 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 but that wouldn't get across what's going on or the fact that you know, the room is a little full, which is flattering to me. Or, you know, none of that stuff um, comes through from just labeling the pixels. Um, so here's Andrew Eng's statement um, that's actually from the article that I alluded to before. He says, if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, we can probably automate it using AI either near in the future. I think of what statisticians do, which is they tell people how to use their tools, and deep learning is a tool, and they say, but there are certain assumptions that need to be met. And you could take that logic and apply it to what Andrew said and get a, a sentence that I think comes much closer to the truth but is much less exciting which is if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought and we can gather an enormous amount of directly relevant data, we have a fighting chance so long as the test data aren't too terribly different from the training data and the domain doesn't change too much uh, over time. I will talk, by the way, about something that fits exactly in this of domain not changing over time and why you get better results there. But this is the reality of where deep learning is and really, I think, in general, where AI is, deep learning being its best current tool for many tasks. Um, realistically, I wrote in the New Yorker in 2012, um, deep learning, so I've been a critic for a while, D deep learning is only part of the larger challenge of building intelligent machines. Such techniques lack ways of representing causal relationships and are likely to face challenges in acquiring abstract ideas. They have no obvious ways of performing logical inferences, and they are also still a long way from integrating abstract knowledge. The original title for that critique that many of you have read was actually Deep Learning at Five. And the, the point of it was going to be, hey, it's five years since deep learning got really popular. And some of that still exists in the kind of way I wrote the article. And it's five years since I, I wrote this critique. Has there really been any progress? Well, the, the standard view is deep learning has done amazing things in the last five years, which is true. But the standard kind of reading of, of deep learning is it's going to solve everything. It, you know, DeepMind's uh, motto is something like solve intelligence. And I think a lot of people think that what's happened in deep learning and reinforce, deep reinforcement learning, which I'll talk about in a second, has like, taken us a long way towards the hard problems in AI. I would say these are the hard problems in AI. And that deep learning has not actually made much progress on those kinds of problems. 
Um, but of course, people in the field have tended not to listen to me. I think maybe it's changing a little bit. Uh, but they always listen to Yashua Bengio. And I wish I had seen this paper in order to include it in mine. It would, it would have made mine more effective. Um, but I highlighted the relevant part. So they, they did some experiments. They found quantitative evidence supporting the hypothesis that deep convolutional neural networks tend to learn surface statistical regularities in the data set rather than higher, le ab higher level abstract concepts. I think that's basically the right characterization of deep learning. So things that don't need higher level abstraction, it's a really nice tool. Um, but it's just one tool in a large toolkit of things that people in artificial intelligence uh, should be working with. And we should not confuse the title deep because of a number of layers uh, with the deep representations that we actually need in order to do artificial general intelligence. What do I mean, by the way, about artificial general intelligence before I get to, um, to the main part of the talk? Well, here are some examples. Um, I meant to delete a line here, but that will be foreshadowing. Um, it means ability to transfer between similar problems, ability to learn from verbal explanation, ability to learn from a relatively small number of examples, ability to work with imperfect information, incomplete information, act on a wide variety of information on the fly in novel ways. I mean, you can come up with your own definition of intelligence. I would say the thing to know about intelligence really is that it's a multidimensional variable. So the IQ test gives us the illusion there's like one number. You have more of it, you have less of it. Um, you're somewhere on this continuum. Um, I think there are actually lots, of, I'm not unique in thinking this, there are lots of aspects um, that go into intelligence. These are some of, of the examples. The flexibility in novel ways is really, I think, the core of human intelligence. You could say, for example, I don't know, that a, an eagle has a lot of intelligence in how it um, is able to interpret a visual scene from very far away, plan a very complex path, swoop down, um, and gather its prey. What's interesting about people is how many different things we can do. You can come attend a talk on deep learning and then, I don't know, go, go and watch a hockey game later and, and use a different kind of intelligence for that. Um, so I would say that when I'm talking about artificial general intelligence, it's really the ability to take on many different problems and be able to solve them at reasonable levels, maybe not perfectly, but say the problem of driving, which maybe I'll touch on again, or you know, the problem of understanding a lecture. Um, one component of this that I've been pushing on for quite a while is common sense reasoning. Um, on the left is the cover of an ACM article um, or issue that, uh, in which Ernie Davis and I had a review about common sense reasoning. We didn't um, do the cover, but I really love the cover. The, the, the cover is a robot cutting a tree branch down. And uh, in this part of the world, people will realize that's a bad idea. I'm not sure in New York City people have enough experience with chainsaws to understand. <laughs> um, but the point is, you want your robot to do this without too much experience. You know, there's only so many times in which you can't do deep reinforcement learning with many trials of robot. You know, it's expensive. People might be injured. Paperwork to fill out. All kinds of reasons why. And so the point is that common sense knowledge is not the sort of knowledge that you can gain from like billions of trials. Um, one example I think we had in the paper, this is really Ernie Davis's um, example, um, is if you have uh, a spider in a container, you don't need to know everything about the container. As long as you know it's sealed, you can make inferences like the spider is not going to come out. And then I can show you other kinds of containers. And you could very quickly integrate your perceptual knowledge uh, with your knowledge about surfaces and so forth. You can conclude that if I put the spider in the one on the left or the one on the middle, it's not going to get out. If I put it in, on the one on the right and you shake it up, the spider probably will get out. Um, that's what I mean by common sense. You can look at these two. You can tell me which of these the spider is going to be um, safely contained by and which not. Um, you can also learn about new kinds of things. So you can see this thing, which I think is called a yarn feeder. And once I explain that, I tell you it's a yarn feeder, you understand how it works. You could use one yourself. You could recognize another one, even if it was really, really ugly, uh, and so forth. Um, we would like to have AGI. You know, why, why do we care? We would like it for domestic robots. I have two small children, a domestic robot that could clean the house and watch them and protect them. You know, I would pay all kinds of money for that. Um, we would like AGI for medicine so that we can synthesize the whole medical literature with your whole medical record um, and figure out what to do for you. We would like to do automated science. We would like to do complex real world problems. High accuracy driving may actually require AGI, I'll say, just to be controversial. We can come back to that. Um, conver conversational interface, you know, we would like to have AGI. Complex inference, there are all kinds of problems. Um, you, for example, like to be able to analyze a signal transduction cascade and figure out 
out how to build a drug um, around it, or you'd like to understand how a synapse works, and there's you know, 400 proteins in a single synapse. It's not clear that a human being on their own has the computational wherewithal to integrate all this information. So you would like machines to be able to do high quality causal inference like a scientist can, um, but with the volume of data that only machines can deal with. Or you might want a complex chart, only the people in the front row will have any idea what this chart is about. So here's an abstraction of it, um, which you can see further back. And you would like to figure out if, if I integrate all that information, then what is going to happen? Um, and I'll just take it some water. <coughs> Um, I want to take another example. <coughs> you know, here's a kind of inverse captioning problem. <coughs> um, I didn't laugh and drink at the same time. <coughs> Clearly a failure of common sense knowledge. <coughs> so uh, you'd like to be able to see this and what <coughs> figure out what's going on. I could add a word and turn it into a political cartoon. <coughs> um, and you could interpret all that. So why are we not making real progress on the hard problems? Here's my theory. There's a fundamental philosophical error that people in AI are making. And it's an excessive love of parsimony. And that's what the rest of my talk is about. So here is the sexiest paper that came out in deep learning last year. It was published in Nature, which is where the sexiest papers come out. And the title was Mastering the, Go the Game of Go Without Human Knowledge. And what makes it sexy to most people is the without human knowledge, right? So there was already a paper about mastering Go the year before in Nature. Um, and you would think Nature doesn't need to run two papers about mastering the game of Go, but of course something's new. Well, what is the new thing? Well, allegedly, and emphasis on the word allegedly, um, that, that thing is they've done it here without human knowledge. And many people, not me, um, think that that's really sexy. They would like to find a kind of magical solution to AI that is kind of a silver bullet, I think often of physics envy. So in physics, there's at least a belief that we might reduce everything to, roughly speaking, four equations on a t-shirt. And there's a lot of people that want AI, I think, to be the same thing. We will find the right equation, which will be some mixture of reinforcement learning, deep learning, and an unsupervised learning algorithm to be named later, and we will be good to go. And this paper comes close to giving people that flavor. Um, and I, I'm going to do a slight textual analysis of it because um, I'm going to pick on Demis Hassabis and, and crowd. And it's important that you understand that I'm really talking about what they said. I'm not talking about my interpretation of what they said, um, or at least not entirely. They called the paper Mastering Go Without Human Knowledge, not Mastering Go the game of Go with 15 authors who have previously published, or half of whom have previously published papers on world-class Go, which is actually what they did. Um, and they, they didn't say using a mixture of human knowledge gathered in other domains with some fancy algorithms and a lot of computational time, which is what they actually did. They said they achieved superhuman performance starting tabula rasa. So part of what I want to do now is to evaluate that claim. Did they really start tabula rasa? And if they did, what would that mean, and so forth. So um, the, the rest of the talk mostly comes from the second um, and lesser known uh, archive article that I wrote in January. Um, and I hope I'll entice some of you into wanting to read it, Innateness, Alpha Zero, and Artificial Intelligence. And I, in sort of quasi-mathematical terms, said, look, you could think of cognition as a four-place function. So you have innate algorithms, innate representations, you know, things that are built in, innate knowledge, and you have experience, and you try to get to some cognitive place give, given these uh, things. And what DeepMind has done, very convincingly, is to show you can get really good cognitive performance on certain kinds of tasks with values of A and R and K that approach zero. They're not actually zero. Tabula rasa would mean zero, and they're not actually zero. And then the question that we have to ask is, is that observation true for cognition in general? So A is, first thing to realize is A is not actually zero. So they make it sound as if the algorithm is just some one generic kind of thing. They make it sound really as if what they did is they took deep reinforcement learning and they learned to play Go. But that is critically not true. So one of the things they started with was Monte Carlo tree search. Well, Monte Carlo tree search comes straight from the symbolic AI tradition that DeepMind has largely allied itself against, not entirely. Um, They've taken something where you can represent a tree and you can traverse the tree. That's classical AI kind of stuff. And that's critical 
to their success. And it's not like a random discovery that they could apply it to Go, right? People have been applying um, Monte Carlo tree search primarily to Go, not exclusively, but primarily to Go since they figured out how to do it. You know, the reason people really developed the algorithm was for Go. So to say that's not human knowledge is, is absurd. I mean, there's human knowledge. Humans have figured out that if you want to build a Go system that works well, you really better have tree search, because that's the nature of, of the thing. You're going to say, I go there, and the other guy goes there, and I go there, and so forth. You have no way around that. And the idea of taking Monte Carlo samples as you go along, this is obvious to anybody who um, tries to, to build a Go system. So they've taken that critical bit. And then they've done some other things. Um, like they've done a lot of extensive search through hyperparameter space. They have put convolution, which allows you to do translational invariance in just the right places. There are like 17 convolutional layers. They clearly thought you know, very carefully where they should put these convolutional layers. Then they did something um, called data augmentation, which they did for Go, but not for chess, where they later used the same algorithm. So in Go, you can rotate the board, and you can reflect the board. And they built into their data augmentation system uh, things that take that into account. For chess, they didn't put any of that there. And they better not, because you can't reverse or rotate the board in chess. You can't have your pawns all lined up on, on a row. Sorry, no, a rank, I guess is the chess word. Um, what they have actually done is they reduced the amount of domain specific knowledge from the year before. So the, the 2016 paper had a lot of very specific innate knowledge that no human Go player could have innately. Um, like um, how many uh, liberties, uh, how many places a set of stones could go in. Well, that's not innate, even in you know, the world's greatest Go players. I mean, they had to learn about that. But that was actually innately built into the 2016 system. They reduced the, the amount of that stuff. They didn't reduce it to zero. They still built in the rules. In a moment, I will compare to another famous system from DeepMind that didn't actually build in the rules. So they still <clears throat> built in a fair amount of knowledge. But it is true that they reduced the amount of knowledge. But imagine a, a paper submitted to Nature called Mastering the, the Game of Go with Significantly Reduced Human Knowledge. <laughs> that would have been what it was. It wouldn't have gotten it. Um, this is a brief digression. I don't know if in the interest of time, I'm going to go into it too much. But domain specificity is not the same thing as innateness. And some, every time people think about innateness, they seem to confuse these two issues. But you could have innate knowledge that is specific to a particular domain. You could have learned knowledge that's specific to a particular domain. These things are um, orthogonal, or almost. They're not quite orthogonal, but close to orthogonal. So the patellar reflex is a domain-specific bit of machinery in uh, I guess, I don't know, vertebrate bio or mammalian primate biology. I don't actually know who has patellar reflexes. We do. I don't know who else does. Um, I bang, bang your knee, and, and out it goes. Um, well, that's innate. It's very domain specific. It's not a general solution to anything. Face recognition is mostly domain specific. Um, it's partly innate. Chess is domain specific. It's not innate. There's no argument that chess in human beings is innate. General intelligence is, is not particularly domain specific. A part of it is innate. So these things, um, it's good to realize they're not identical. So alpha 0 occupies a particular point in the space of innateness and domain specificity. Where are they in innateness? Um, they have innate machinery for reinforcement learning, which I assume in this crowd you all know what it is, um, Monte Carlo tree search, and they have massive computation. That's what's innate. They also have innately wired rules and representation um, schemes. They took the same algorithm, more or less, and pitted against chess, uh, in chess against something called Stockfish that has a lot more innate stuff. And so they, through that, they have an argument that you can have a sort of cleaner system by some standard that has less innate knowledge that does pretty well. Um, they did not test, for example, what happens if you do get rid of the innate uh, information that's still there. Um, so the result is, you know, in the regime of perfect information board games, provided that experience is unlimited, success can be achieved where knowledge is relatively limited, the rules, um, or representations are relatively limited, and algorithms or reinforcement, Monte Carlo tree search, and empirically derived hyperparameters. So you can think of this as an empirical result in the exploration of what does it take to solve particular problems. And then you can ask, how general is that result? Does it hold more generally for general intelligence? Well, the only thing they said about that is they said Go was one of the hardest problems or something like that in AI, which is sort of true and sort of not. Like, it's surprising 
that they solve Go in 2018 instead of 2023, but that doesn't mean it's as hard as, say, doing natural language understanding or understanding human intentionality or something like that. The argument was kind of made very much by implication, um, saying, look, if we can solve Go, then, then we can use the same strategy. Um, let's skip that. So then the question is, like, is Go representative of anything? So Go, Chess, and Shogi, they, they've applied to all these things. Highly complex games where you have perfect information. You can simulate them perfectly, which is critical. They do all this self-play in order to get the system to work. You have unlimited data as a consequence. And all that matters is the board state. Um, as Kevin pointed out to me when we had a nice discussion about poker, um, if you're playing poker with one other person, and you can see all the cards and so forth, um, you, have, you have shared knowledge. But if you're playing poker with seven people, some of whom might be your allies and you're kind of squeezing out um, the, the uh, less experienced people in the room or whatever, then you start to have to have like a theory of um, mind component. None of that's there. Life, by comparison um, to the games that DeepMind did this work on, is well, it's also highly complex, so some piece of it has been captured. But we have imperfect information. We can't simulate anything interesting in life perfectly. We have modest amounts of data for most tasks that we do, other than like maybe catching a fly ball if you watch American baseball. Um, and you, know, you can practice that many, many times. Um, and essentially, anything can matter. So you're not limited to just this particular set of information on this board state. Um, and so I gave you this slide before. I meant to introduce it here. You don't need any of the stuff that you need for AGI in the context of Go. You don't need the transfer between problems. You don't need to learn from verbal explanation. Um, if I change the board size to 21 by 21 instead of 19 by 19, it's not clear that the system would even understand the concept of a line across that board because it's really trained with respect to a particular board. Um, it obviously hasn't learned from a small number of examples. There's nothing like imp incomplete information or imperfect information. There's no requirement to learn on the fly. So even though it was sort of pitched as if it was a model of, of AGI, it just really isn't. So then you can ask, <coughs> would what DeepMind discovered about board games transfer to other kinds of tasks? Well, so far, as far as I know, they haven't tested on any of these things, games of inf perfect information. They haven't even done what they did with the Atari game system, which I'm going to come to in a minute, which would be to have the input only be pixels. So you can imagine, at least, let's see, could you learn Go from a video camera and self-play? But it's not clear that, in fact, I'm willing to guess, they couldn't immediately do that. So they actually have an abstraction of the board in which they say where the pieces are. Um, and then, you know, as far as I know, I'm calling it Alpha Star. There's a series of um, programs, Alpha Go, Alpha Go Zero, and um, Alpha Zero, I think, was the last one. Um, so al as far as we, I know, Alpha Star has not been applied to any open-ended real-world task, anything involving no knowledge integration, anything at all involving transfer. So the critical question that I left out is, would it transfer to anything else? It was implicit. Well, there's some suggestive evidence. Um, and one is that AlphaZero's nearest proxies have, have struggled with transfer. So um, think about their Atari game system, which I, I've alluded to a couple of times, but not quite mentioned. Right? So their first big nature paper was showing that they could learn from pixels, getting only score and practicing by moving joysticks in different directions. They could get human or superhuman level performance in a bunch of video games. There were actually a serious problem here that reviewers neglected to ask them about, which is, can you transfer from one level of a game to another level of a game? The answer is no, more or less, or at least under a lot of conditions. Uh, so the, the paper was actually flawed, but the reviewers didn't notice. Um, in any case, that paper w you could think of as, as a, in a way, a proxy. In a way, it's actually doing something much more impressive than Alpha Zero or Alpha Go. Right? Alpha Go got all this press last year. But what this did is it learned without being told what the rules were for breakout, for space invaders, and so forth. Whereas Alpha Zero actually has to be told exactly what all the rules are. So it's actually, as an empiricist demonstration, empiricist meaning non-innate um, tabula rasa, it's actually less impressive um, than the original Atari game stuff. But it doesn't work that well. Um, so this, this is from the company that I was running until, until we sold it um, to Uber. Um, so what we did is we built a, a three-dimensional video game um, ran the Atari game uh, deep learning engine, ACE from, from sorry, EC3, um, from DeepMind. And it learned our video game, no problem. So you know, basically, in human terms, um, it's fly between the posts. And the system learns that. But then we just move the posts around. 
And suddenly the system was really not very good at the game. Now I'm not saying it couldn't learn that level, but the cr critical question is, have you actually learned the abstraction that I just described of fly between the posts? And it's clear that you know, given our training regime, it had not actually done that. Now, we never published that because we got busy selling ourselves. Um, <coughs> but um, and so anyway, we didn't. But um, uh, Vicarious published essentially the same kind of results. Um, so they had results like you move the, the Space Invaders character a few pixels and suddenly it doesn't work anymore. Or you move the, um, the paddle and break out and the system doesn't, doesn't work anymore. Um, and we know that deep reinforcement learning is vulnerable to the same kind of thing I was talking about earlier, which is adversarial attack. So this is a paper that came out about a year ago by Peter Abiel and uh, some of his collaborators showing essentially the same kinds of failures. Um, meanwhile, DeepMind has tried to do other things and really not done nearly as well. And I think that we should learn from that. So, so they have, for example, tried to learn language from a system that goes around, tries to navigate, gets feedback for picking the right objects in some kind of scenario. Ostensibly, this should not be harder than Go. Um, you know, a three-year-old, I, I have one, can easily do this task. And my three-year-old is not ready to play Go at a world-class level. And you know, maybe she will be eventually, and maybe she won't. Um, but in any case, you know, three years on the planet suffice to do this kind of thing, no problem. Pick the magenta object in the green room. Uh, my three-year-old is you know, at ceiling at these sorts of things. Um, DeepMind, you know, they made some progress, but it would take like 50,000 trials to learn a new word. My daughter learns a new word in like five trials, or 10 trials, or sometimes one. Um, and there's actually, it's not just my daughter, there's a, a long-standing uh, psychology literature on what's called vast mapping. And so, you know, there we don't have superhuman performance, we have vastly subhuman performance. Um, they didn't put it in the original paper, I think it might be in a later one, but I, I took a screenshot when I saw the data because I thought it was so telling. Um, they did other things like negation, stay out of the fridge, and the system couldn't do it at all. Right? So um, there's certain kinds of pattern matching the system can do reasonably well. Things that come closer to like the demands of logic, they can't do at all. Um, my, my friend Peter Voss has a long list of the things you need to do for natural language understanding. Negation is somewhere in this list and he has, talks about other things like comparatives and doing and and or and reasoning and implication and so forth. I would assert, um, or, or bet, I guess would be more proper, that the DeepMind system probably can't do any of these things. The getting to do even one it takes vast amounts of work. Um, meanwhile, DeepMind's not alone in these struggles. As, as I argued in the other paper, in more open-ended problems, neural networks often break down in dramatic ways. I already gave you the data for that, so now I'll just give you a cartoon. Um, this is the difference between machine learning in a little demo in ImageNet and doing it in the real world. You have your system trained, it says that's definitely a frog and, and, and it's not. Um, okay. One of the things I said in this paper that I wrote in late January is that moving to other problems would probably require other innate machinery. So there's an illusion here that if I can solve Go with a small amount of innate machinery, maybe that's all I need. And what I said is, come on. Um, I said, in more open-ended worlds, the amount of innate machinery will go up. And here's a quote. I said, what's true for Go may not be true for many other challenges. Ultimately, it seems, I'm skipping a sentence here. Ultimately, it seems likely that many different types of tasks will have their own innate requirements. Monte Carlo tree search for board games, syntactic tree manipulation operations for language understanding, geometric primitives for 3D scene uh, understanding, theory of mind for problems demanding social coalitions. Um, 17th of January 2018. I'm telling you the exact date because not five weeks later, DeepMind of all places came out with a paper that was exactly like the paper that I was criticizing, but it was in a new domain and they did exactly what I anticipated, which is they came up with a new set of innate primitives that were tailored to that domain that were entirely different from the set of innate primitives that they needed for Go. So I wrote a medium piece that you can read called DeepMind's Misleading Campaign Against Innateness and the fun the part that was the most fun was choosing the clip art for it, as you can see. Um, and you, you can read it later, but they built in three distinct representational planes to distinguish the walls from the objects, from the agents, and all that kind of stuff is buried in the appendices and, and so forth. But it was the same thing. It's like I didn't deliberately set a trap per se, although I did think somebody might eventually prove my point, but they just, they just walked right into what I said the problem. Is. So here's part of the real problem. I think is there's a bias in the field. Nobody wants to talk about nativism in AI. I had this debate with Jan Lacuna, you can watch it online, 
so you can get a more representative view than I am able to muster myself. Um, you can hear Jan you know, give his side of the story. Um, and when we were trying to figure out what to debate about, David Chalmers, the philosopher at NYU, convened the debate, we threw out some possibilities. And one of them, actually Jan threw out, was, was nativism and AI. And here, here was David Chalmers' response was, when I do a Google search on na nativism and AI, I get a did you mean message. Like People don't want to talk about it. Um, that's changed a little in the last few weeks. Why don't they want to talk about it? I think it's because they think it's cheating. So here is Tom Dieterich responding um, actually to the first paper I wrote in January. He says, I think most machine learning people think that the methods for incorporating prior knowledge in the form of symbolic rules, um, which is another strand here, are too heavy handed. And while very useful from an engineering point of view, don't contribute to a plausible theory of general intelligence. I don't know where he gets this from. This is not you know, something that follows from psychology or from neuroscience or so forth. I think it's really just an aesthetic um, that I don't want to cloud my models up with innate structure. But if you look at the biology, this is insane. So um, here, for example, is one of my favorite neglected papers that came out in 1999 where um, Thomas Sudhoff, who later won the Nobel Prize, did an experiment in which he completely cut off synaptic transmission in a developing mouse embryo. And then he went and tried to say, well, what are the consequences of that? And so there are pairs of pictures left, left and right here of a normal mouse brain and the brain of a mouse with no synaptic transmission, which basically means no learning of the conventional sort happening um, in, in, uh, in utero. And he couldn't find any differences. Now, I'm not saying there aren't any differences. You know, we might now or eventually be able to find some differences that were too subtle um, to be discovered using the, the neuroscience techniques that were available almost 20 years ago. But there is very good reason, nonetheless, to think that the basic structure, the basic first draft of a mouse brain or human brain is more or less there prior to any important learning from the world. In fact, in humans, 95% or greater than 95%, almost, almost or over 99% of our genes are expressed in the brain uh, at some point, and, and many of them expressed in development. Um, a significant number of these are expressed in specific ways. So, you know, neural networks sort of have a giant brain as spam. You have the same kind of nodes all the way across the brain. If you look at the actual brain, you have specific gene expression um, for specific cells building a very specific uh, first draft. So from the perspective of biology, to have a bias against nativism just doesn't make any sense. That's what biology does, is it builds innate structure. And then you know the system goes out in the world with that innate structure, and it calibrates and learns and acts and so forth. But you know, the, the basis the, on which evolution works is it builds genes that build innate structure. And to say, no, nope, I'm not going to do that in my AI. I'm going to tie my hands behind my back. Well, I just don't get that, um, knowing something about biology. Um, and knowing something about cognitive development, I also don't get it. So here's, here's a kind of argument from Liz Felke, who I think is one of the, the world's greatest developmental psychologists. She's at Harvard, she had this line a number of years ago, which um, I love to quote. She says, if children are endowed innately, innately is my word, but it's from the context, with abilities to perceive objects, persons, sets, and places, then they may use their perceptual experience to learn about their properties and behaviors of such identities. If you start with those things, if you start with some basis for understanding the world, um, it's far from clear how children could learn anything about the entities in a domain, however, if they couldn't single out those entities in their surroundings. So he's basically saying, if you start with a complete blank slate, you're screwed. And in fact, nobody actually does. Even in papers where they say they're starting with a complete blank slate, they don't, because you would be screwed if you didn't. So in this paper, um, in this kind of originated in debate with Jan McCoon, I put out some proposals for things that I think might plausibly be innate in humans and that we might plausibly want to build into our AI systems if we want to take them beyond being just tabula rasa perceptual classifiers. So that includes things like representations of objects, structured, alge uh, structured algebraic representations, operations over variables, type token distinction. Most of those are drawn from my 2001 book, The Algebraic Mind. And then some things drawn from Spelke, like capacity to represent sets, locations, paths, trajectories, and so forth. A way of representing the affordances, what objects can do for you, causality, spatiotemporal co contiguity. Translational invariance, which is actually Jan McCoon's convolutional uh, technique, and a capacity for cost-benefit analysis. So in a way, I'm placing a bet saying, if you don't build all of these things in, you're not going to get very far towards AGI. If you do build all these things in, you might get a lot further. In the course of the debate, Chalmers said to Lacoon, how many of these would you build in? 
and again, translational invariance is convolution networks, which was what he's famous for. He said, we don't need any of them. Just give me enough data. We don't need any of them. So there was a genuine disagreement there. Um, it's not, not a straw man. Um, nobody ever seems to believe that humans have anything innate except temperament. I don't know why, but people are like, yeah, my two kids, their temperament is different. Everything else they, they, they think is not innate, is learned, um, which is why I like to show people this video. Um, of a baby ibex climbing down a mountain. So people don't have such strong prejudices about the prior innate cognitive systems of an ibex. But if you watch them, it's sort of like my um, common sense example with the tree limb, right? You can't afford to make many mistakes. You can have um, non-ancestors that made mistakes, but you have to have come from an unbroken chain of ancestors that never made mistakes on the mountain. Hence, you probably have some innate structure there. <clears throat> Comparison, of course, is robots. <laughs> this, by the way, is worth noting, comes from the DARPA competition, where all the tasks were known in advance and simulated in advance. So gave you know, all of the best teams in the world a lot of advanced planning, but <laughs> you're still not there yet. So I think the $100 billion question in the sense of how much money is being invested in AI across the world in the next decade is how many of these kinds of things are actually required for AGI? Is it none like Jan thinks or do maybe we need all of them before we're going to get there? Do we need symbols, variables, operations over variables, uh, ways of representing trees and so forth? Causality I should really have that whole list. Um, so to wrap up so far, and I'm almost done and I'll take your question. <coughs> Nobody has actually mastered Go without human knowledge. That's ridiculous. They took a team full of Go, Go experts, took all the best techniques, or many of the best techniques that we use for Go, and then did a lot of engineering to, to make that work. Every do, new domain is probably actually going to need new priors and new innate knowledge. So yeah, you can, you can play chess and Go with the same machine, but that doesn't mean that, that you can solve medicine with the same thing. Um, most of our genome participates in wiring our brains. Innate machinery clearly matters for biology. Now, it's a question, does it matter for AI as well? But at least we have a strong inspiration or reason to, to consider it. Why are we even trying to build AI without innate structure? This is the part that mystifies me. Like, I think, again, and there's an aesthetic thing. People think it would be nicer if we can do without it. OK, but we've been trying that for a really long time. Maybe we should try something else. Um, I don't think deep learning alone is getting us to AGI. Maybe we should look somewhere else. Um, and here's my, my final coda. Um, which has a little bit of a Vancouver tinge to it, you'll see in a second, um, or some of you will notice in a second. Um, there's actually a ton of in innateness in every neural network, right? Neural networks are the thing that are popular right now. They actually have lots of innateness. Nobody wants to call it that, but it's there. So the question is whether it's the right kind of innateness. So what's innate is people fiddle around. How many layers should I have? What types of layers? Should they be fully connected? Should they be convolutional layers? How many units should be in each layer? Should I have Monte Carlo tree search in there somewhere? What should a unit's activity function be? What should the learning rate be? What algorithms should do the training? Um, what, what should the input units stand for? And people you know, tie themselves in knots coming up with all kinds of um, insane or interesting things to do that. Um, and then they even have that, if that's not enough, they have a whole other set of parameters, which they, nowadays they call curriculum design, which is like, in what order should I present the data? My daughter did not come to me and say, Daddy, can you give me the simpler problems before the harder problems? Like, she just deals with the data as it comes and has managed to understand the world no problem. She's not worried about batch normalization and, and you know, the sequence. <laughs> so the real question is, what kind of innateness do we want? Um, this is an XKCD cartoon. I hope you've all seen it, or now, now you will have. Um, one, <clears throat> one person says to the other, this is your machine learning system. And the other says, yep, you just pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, and then you collect the answers on the other side, which is basically what machine, or at least what deep learning is. Um, but what if the answers are wrong? Well, you just stir the pile until they start looking right. <laughs> There are papers now about replicability crises in machine learning. And that's because every time you stir the pot, it's a little bit different. And you can't stir it exactly the same way, as Heraclitus kind of almost told us. So this is my kids in, in Stanley Park. Um, and I, maybe the animation works, and maybe it doesn't. I think we should be looking at the primitives in their heads. Um, the representations and primitives in their head that are built for comprehending, built by evolution for comprehending the behavior of objects, agents, and their actions. That's where I think we should be looking for our innate structures, and I thank you very much.
Those are things you can read, and we have time for questions. Though. We do have time for questions, but if people have to leave, if you have you know, obligations, I understand if you leave now, that's fine. Uh, but we'll take questions, I'm sure there are questions. There are already some hands up. So part of your description, you had neural networks for good at perception, and as a whole of others. Part of perception, a subset perception. of perception. And the other part was you sort of trying to imply that neural networks plus innateness would solve a lot of this problem. And I'm just wondering how much of that other stuff that wasn't perception you think would be solved by neural I, I should not have elided the argument. So, so um, and I didn't entirely. So, so one piece of the argument in the two papers that I didn't go through in as much depth because I didn't think I could fit everything into the talk today, but I had a little bit, is I think these things are important. And these things are not really the proper domain of neural networks. Symbols actually, even neural networks have them. I can argue that. It's not very interesting, so I won't right now. Um, what's really critical in classical AI and classical computer programming is that you have variables and you have operations over variables. So if you're talking about a microprocessor, you can add things into an accumulator, you can compare them to something, maybe you can branch somewhere. That's how you build computer programs. If, if you're talking about a higher level language, then the variables are much more abstract. They can be like build a neural network, and I will give you two parameters, which will be the number of layers and the number of nodes. And that is defined to work for all possible inputs, um, all possible arguments for those operations. In a computer science department, I don't need to tell you this, but they're, um, outside a computer science department, people don't understand this. They don't understand that the way that the world software works is you put together operations over variables. Um, and there's this fantasy now, in fact, that we're going to replace computer programmers. I've seen a bunch of articles about, oh my god, all these people are studying to be computer programmers and they're going to be replaced by machine learning. To which I say, do you have any idea what it would be like to build a browser by doing input-output pairs? <laughs> like, it's not going to happen. Right? We still need computer programmers to put together operations over variables. And I think to solve hard problems, we still need to do that. So I think you know, a very simplified answer, but you know, a step in the right direction is, and, and you know, it's very consistent with your research program. I think that we need to have neural networks because they're great at classification, and classification is part of most complicated problems, not all, but many, many problems. We don't want to throw away this great tool for classification, but we don't want to throw away all the things we learned about computer programming, about modular structure, passing parameters, all this kind of stuff. Um, having operations over variables that um, don't just work for the 20 cases that you've seen before, but work, identify, your, I mean, are, are designed like to work over all the integers or all the floating point numbers. I think this is critical to have this symbolic component. So like the stuff you're doing on, on merging probabilistic programming with some kind of um, machine learning and you know, maybe some deep learning, I, I think that's going to be necessary and the innate structure. I think a lot of the innate knowledge can't be properly represented unless you have the structured knowledge that I'm talking about here. I think that what happens when you do things over deep learning it's great talking in front of a computer science department. I don't often get that privilege. Um, you guys will, will know about the difference between having a propositional logic as opposed to one with quantification, or at least a lot of people in the room will, will know that difference. Um, in deep learning, you're basically, it's like you're enumerating propositions. And you don't have the quantification to say something holds in general. So one example I sometimes give is I've trained neural networks on um, the identity function, f of x equals x, for even numbers, even binary numbers. And then I get, I test, will it generalize to odd numbers? And they don't. It doesn't matter how many, I mean, there are ways you can solve this problem. But under ordinary kind of multi-layer perceptron regime um, with discrete uh, distributed representations, it doesn't matter how many hidden layers you have. Um, it's amazing to me how many people work with neural networks and don't believe this. And they have to like go and actually try it. Because um, if you understand the logic, you realize the problem is not actually IID. I'm actually pushing the system to do something it really doesn't know how to do, and it breaks down. Um, and there's no operation over variables about identity. You're, you're emulating identity for the even numbers, for a space of things in the even numbers. You can generalize within the training space of those even numbers, but I push you outside the space, and the system really doesn't understand the identity function. Um, so I think this stuff is critical. Oh, there was a question over here. Yeah. 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 Um, so for those of us that want to start putting some innateness into our uh, AI, um, do you think we should just go with current computer vision methods or should we actually use neural nets to build specialist classifiers for things? Like, where, where do people start with some of these ideas? I mean, I think it starts with some ideas like probabilistic programming. I'm not 100% committed to that particular um, formalism, but I think you have to start by saying, how am I going to represent some basic facts? Like, objects move on paths that are connected in space and time, which is 
one of the ones that Spelke emphasizes. Um, and I think you know, reading her work and her colleague Susan Carey, um, and there's an old paper by Jean Mandler, How to Build a Baby Too. Um, I think reading some of that work, thinking about what are the primitives that babies use to navigate the world. Um, and part of what Spelke does that's interesting that I, again, didn't have time for, is she talks about a core versus a periphery. So there, in most of these domains, there's a core set of problems kids can do pretty well, and they get more complicated, and they, they can't do the calibration that well. So little babies know that if an object goes behind a screen, um, that it ought to come back out again, but they're fuzzy about, like, how big should that screen be before I wouldn't see it anymore? So there's, there's a lot of detail of the world that, that has to be learned, but there's some basics, like objects don't just wink in and out of existence. You know, the famous um, Piagetian thing about kids not having object permits is just wrong. I mean, the, there's ample more recent experiments that show it's not true. Kids know that objects continue to persist. We have perceptual systems, deep learning systems, that don't even have a representation of what an object is. Um, Daniel Kahneman and the late Ann Treisman, who just passed away, have work on what they call object files. You can think of it as like an index card for each object that's in your scenario. There are certainly some systems that do some of that, but deep learning systems don't. They don't have representations of individual objects, so they can't like accumulate a dossier on this particular object. Here are all the things I know about Don. No, I'm not going to finish that sentence. But anyway, um, not too many people got where I was going with it, but a few did. And it just so happens in 10 days, Frank Wood will be here. And with David Poole, we'll have a world-class group in probabilistic programming. More questions? But there's a question in the front row. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, I mean, you've outlined a number of different things that, that you know, there's that list of 10 things. Do you imagine kind of studying them as a, as a joint system as a whole or studying them separately? They're, they're pretty, well, there's different ways to answer that. But first, let's get the list on where they have it. Um, it, it. It's a pretty heterogeneous set. So, so yeah. The, the, they might afford of a common solution? I don't think that they do. Um, I won't say that they can. But the way I would think about it is, from a cognitive psychology perspective, I think these are different kinds of things and at somewhat different levels. Um, so some of them are basically representational facts. I mean, again, it's great to be in a computer science department. You can think about you know, the famous title about, um, what is it, programs equal algorithms plus data structures. So some of these are really data structure issues. Having um, a representation of trees, I don't know if that's actually on here. Well, the structured algebraic representation basically consists of that. that. That's a data structure issue. And I think part of what makes humans different from other animals is that we're really good at representing and manipulating tree structures. We're not perfect. Binding is actually kind of a bugaboo for us. And we can't do it in an unlimited way. But we're pretty good at representing kind of recursive structures on trees. And that starts as a representational thing. Um, Knowing about causality is partly a representational thing. You have to have what a linguist would call a diacritic. You have to represent, yes, this is or isn't. But you have to have a bunch of algorithms that help you decide by looking at contingencies and doing interventions and things like that. And so you, know, you, you need algorithms that are going to try to infer the causality. You can think about like Judea Pearl stuff as at least you know, a cut on that. And that's going to be maybe different from how you think about sets and locations. And you know, like causality is going to cross-cut a lot of these, not all of them. But when I look at the human mind, what I see is a lot of different mechanisms, not one. Like I see all these people in AI looking for one. Not everybody in AI does this, obviously. But I see a lot of people in AI looking for a single mechanism. But when I look at, say, the brain imaging results from humans, what they really show is that we're, we're so good at is taking like 40 different brain areas, you can count them different ways, and deciding for this task that I just learned 12 seconds ago to do in the scanner for this experimentalist or for this real world task, which of these 40 things I'm going to put together in this combination, right? It, there, there was an old idea in neuroscience, which is you just used more resources for harder problems. And the resources were kind of undifferentiated. We know that that's wrong. We don't know exactly what the individual brain areas do, but you know, they're relatively systematic. And solving a particular task, like playing the guitar or drinking a bottle or whatever, uh, they each have their own constellation of these different um, mechanisms. I think we should be looking for something more like that. Um, and just very briefly, and then I'll take uh, the last question. I had a paper called The Atoms of Computation in Science in 2014 that laid out some of this. Question there. Um, so I'm not entirely sure that all of this is a big surprise to people in the deep learning community. 
I think it's a general problem in, in science where people try and publish things and overstate what what they can do and, and what their discoveries are um, because that gets them more grant money and they can continue their research. Yeah, yeah. Also, I think uh, looking for some general algorithms or general concepts can be a good thing because quite often the way we understand things is a lot more complex than the lower dimensional manifold than they actually sit on. And it's quite often worth finding those things because we can, we can do things like inference more efficiently. Um, you didn't put that in the form of a question, but I'll take it as a question. Um, it was more like a comment. Um, the, the, the first piece of it, I will say, there's a lot of wiggle room about what people actually mean as compared to what they say and what they write in their papers and so forth. Um, if you're interested in that sort of issue, I went through a lot of it in, in the medium paper about like what people actually say. Do they really think that, I mean I had people who said deep learning um, has never been intended to be AGI, has always been intended to be AGI and you know, um, I, I'm not going to argue that point right now except to say that certainly this stuff has been presented to the world as if it's a universal solvent that it is not. Um, whether people believe the presentation or not, I don't know. The second part I think is more su substantive is really about methodology. The second part is like should we look for general principles even in a complicated world where they might not be true? Um, and one theory that I have heard espoused in, in an immense number of times is what I'm doing is I'm taking like a very dumb algorithm. I know it can't work and I'll, you know, I'll upgrade to the next thing as soon as I'm persuaded that I, that I need to do so. But most of the time people don't actually do that. What they actually do is they put little band-aids on whatever system they have and this goes back to the first part of your question which is about human nature. What human nature, which you're quite right about, um, the other part of human nature is I want to get the grant so I'm never going to admit defeat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a thingamajig to my diddly dot and then do this and you know I'm going to claim that it still works. And I have seen this in the deep learning world for before it was called the deep learning world for 20 some years. There's when it gets down to the hardcore engineering people abandon that. So um, in order to get go to work um, DeepMind abandoned some of its premises like don't build in the rules and um, don't have any symbol manipulation, which they had both of which were true in the Atari game system um, and started to be a little bit more ecumenical about it. But I have not seen a kind of similar trend in the theoretical world um, with one exception that I will mention maybe to close um, where people have tried to kind of explore outside the space of, of the models that are popular right now. The one exception that I'm pretty excited about though, I don't think it's going to work as constituted but it might eventually is this trend doesn't even really have a name yet um, but something like differentiable programming and I had a bunch of slides that I didn't show um, on it. So there are people that are now actually building neural networks that do have symbol manipulation um, and if I can give one reference there, there's a great paper from DeepMind um, by Evans and Greffenstedt that is called learning rules in noisy data I think that came out this year um, in archive where they have all of the stuff that a symbol manipulation um, fan might have combined with all of the differentiation you might expect from the deep learning world and I think that's a great trend and I'm, I'm glad to see it finally starting to happen. Um, and on that optimistic note, I thank you very much. I think we'll